What do you know about the Battle of Hastings? I'm sure you've heard of it. It was fought in 1066 on October the 14th, and it's arguably the most important battle in all of English history. Led by Duke William of Normandy, the invading Norman forces defeated the English army commanded by King Harold Godwinson. This victory allowed William the Conqueror to ascend to the English throne. The battle significantly influenced not only the English language, but their culture, their governance, and it layered the foundation for the medieval English kingdom and dramatically altered the course of history forever. Hello and welcome to the channel. Are you new here? Well, it's good to meet you. And if you're coming back, it's good to have you with me again. As always, if you want to support the channel, the links to the Patreon is in the description. Otherwise, if you really want to help me out, get YouTube to push my videos out to a broader audience by clicking the like button. Did you do it? Thanks for that. Now, without further ado, make yourself comfortable, and let's learn all about the Battle of Hastings. Let's go back to the lead up. Understand how we get to this point. In the year 911, Charles the Simple of the Carolingian dynasty granted land in Normandy to a Viking leader named Rollo and a few of his followers. The settlement did extremely well, and they thrived with other Vikings quickly assimilating into local culture. They even converted to Christianity, and intermarried with the locals. Everything was going swimmingly. Over time, Normandy grew in territory, and subsequently, influence. A significant connection between Normandy and England was established in 1002, when King Æthelred II of England married Emma, sister of Richard II, the Duke of Normandy. Their son, Edward the Confessor, spent many of his early years in exile in Normandy, and ascended to the English throne finally in the year 1042. His reign saw a substantial Norman influence in England, as he filled the English court and the church with his Norman buddies. Childless, and in conflict with the powerful Earl Godwin of Wessex. Edward's actions possibly paved the way for William of Normandy's claim to the English throne. The death of King Edward on the 5th of January 1066 plunged England into a succession crisis, with several contenders vying for the throne each thinking that they had the biggest claim. The most immediate one of these claims came from Harold Godwinson, the Earl of Wessex, a wealthy and influential nobleman who was actually elected by the Wittangemot and crowned by Archbishop Eldred of York. This election, however, was mired in more than a little bit of controversy, fueled by Norman claims that Stigand, the disputed Archbishop of Canterbury, performed the ceremony, and he was not meant to do that. Well, Harold's claim was quickly contested by the Duke of Normandy, Duke William, who alleged that Edward had promised him the throne, and that Harold had sworn to support William's claim. Similarly, Harald Hardrada of Norway entered the fray himself, citing an agreement between Magnus the Good of Norway and Hartha Knut of England 
that allowed for a mutual inheritance of the thrones of England and Norway in the absence of an heir. Well, this is, of course, how wars begin. Both William and Hardrada began to muster forces for their respective invasions, setting the stage for a rather turbulent year. Now in the meantime, Harold's estranged brother, Tostig Godwinson, initiated a series of his own raids, devastating southeastern England, leveraging a fleet from Flanders and additional ships from Orkney. His campaign eventually led him northwards, where he encountered resistance from Edwin of Mercia and Morcar of Northumbria, forcing him to retreat to Scotland. There, Tostig took some time to regroup, and gathered a new force to support his ambitions. Now on to Harald Hardrada, whose invasion in the early September of the same year marked another escalation in the conflict. In command of a formidable fleet of over 300 ships, and an army of around 15,000 men. Hardrada, joined by Tostig, made a dramatic entry into northern England. Their combined forces quickly took the city of York, following a decisive victory over Edwin and Morcar's army at the Battle of Fulford on the 20th of September. The English military structure in the 11th century was somewhat regional, centered around the Fyrd. What is that? Well, it's a local levy of landowning men equipped by their community. The system required one man for military service for every five hides of land, with the hundred serving as the Fyrd's organizational unit. In total, when everything was worked out, England could muster about 14,000 men when fully mobilized. However, a full national call-up to mobilize was pretty rare, and it occurred only three times between 1046 and 1065. According to the feared the king maintained a force of personal warriors, known as housecars, who were better armoured and served as the core of royal forces. Local thanes, or landowning elites, either joined the royal housecars or the retinue of an earl. Now, in anticipation of William of Normandy's invasion in 1066, King Harold Godwinson stationed a significant force that dotted the south coast. By September, needing to return to their fields for harvest, Harold dismissed the bulk of his militia. However, upon hearing of Harold Hardrada's invasion in the north, Harold rapidly gathered forces and marched to confront the Norwegians. The ensuing Battle of Stamford Bridge on the 25th of September ended in a decisive English victory, with both Hardrada and Torstig killed, and the Norwegian forces decimated, reducing their fleet from 300 to just 24 ships. Now, I've already discussed the Battle of Stamford Bridge in a different video, but in case you don't know, it's quite an interesting battle. From memory, I'll try to recount it. So, effectively, the uh, Hardrada and his allies had shown up to York. York had surrendered. Well, they went to meet with the people of York who they believed were going to do an official handover of the city. But when they got to the meeting spot, it was not 
them. It was about nine thousand or so English soldiers ready to wipe the floor with them. Well, each side stood across the bridge and prepared for battle, and apparently on the Norwegian side there was a single warrior who went out to the middle of the bridge and took on swaths of Englishmen, one berserker, completely drunk off the adrenaline of battle. Well, eventually he got taken down. But Hadrada got done over in this battle as well. Apparently, when he was in the heat of things, he ended up copping an arrow into the middle of his neck. Certainly not the best way to go. If you get an arrow in your neck like that, it is not an instant death, but rather a very slow and painful way to check out. Certainly not good. So, that's effectively what happened at the Battle of Stamford Bridge. Stunning English victory. And the Norwegians had to go all the way back home. So, despite this triumph, the, the victory, rather, significantly depleted Harold's army, leaving it weakened for the subsequent challenges it would face from the south. Oh, and it's Harold of the English army, not Harald of the Norwegian army, so don't get confused. I know. They, they could have made that easier. Well, it's just the way it is. Now, under William of Normandy, who orchestrated a meticulous invasion plan that was planned for over nine months, assembling a vast fleet and army from across Normandy and France, with notable contributions from Brittany and Flanders, whom they were on fairly good terms with. This endeavour required building a fleet from scratch, and securing, according to some Norman chronicles, diplomatic backing to do so. Among these accounts is the claim that Pope Alexander II supported William's cause with a papal banner, a detail primarily sourced from William of Poitiers, and absent in contemporary narratives, casting a little bit of doubt on its authenticity. Raises a few eyebrows, doesn't it? Now, an interesting thing happened in April. The appearance of Halley's Comet, recorded in April of 1066, recorded all the way across Europe, was interpreted as a kind of ominous sign linked to the ongoing succession crisis in England. I mean, a little bit of stretching on the interpretation, but, you know, it has to mean something, right? Well... William gathered his assembled forces and son Valéry sur Somme, poised for the channel crossing by mid-August, ready and rearing to go. However, the invasion was postponed, possibly due to adverse weather conditions, or to elude the English naval defences. It could have been a storm, though, Seems to be a good way to get rid of a fleet. Just ask the Spanish. The Normans finally set sail shortly after Harold Godwinson's triumph at the Battle of Stanford Bridge. Benefiting from the dispersal of the English fleet. They landed at Pevensey in Sussex on the 28th of September with a few vessels veering off to Romney, where they engaged the local feared. Upon landing, William's forces quickly established a foothold by constructing a wooden castle at Hastings to serve as a base for further raids and fortifications, including additional works at Pevensey. The composition and size of William the Conqueror's invasion force 
still remains a little bit uncertain. With contemporary sources and modern historians, all providing their own varied estimates. Now, a historical document at the time cites 776 ships in William's fleet, but this is probably exaggerated. Contemporary writers' estimates of the army's size range wildly, from 14,000 to a completely ridiculous 150,000. Certainly the period has a penchant for hyperbole. Modern historians come in with a little bit more plausible numbers, estimating William's force to be between seven and perhaps up to 12,000 men, including a significant cavalry component of one to 3,000 horsemen. The consensus among scholars is that the army was approximately half infantry, while the remainder divided between cavalry and archers, and possibly crossbowmen. Despite the existence of lists naming William's companions at Hastings, only about 35 individuals can be reliably confirmed to have been present. The Norman army was well equipped, with chainmail hauberks as the main form of armour. These knee-length chainmail shirts, some with sleeves and silks for riding, were complemented by conical metal helmets featuring a nose guard. The force was divided into infantry and cavalry, with the infantry wielding round, wood and metal reinforced shields, and the cavalry adopting kite-shaped shields better suited for mounted combat. While the lance was a common weapon among the horsemen, the difficult terrain at Hastings probably limited its usual effectiveness, favouring the use of straight swords, javelins and long spears for combat. Some cavalry might have opted for a mace over a sword. Archers, an essential component of the force, utilised self-bows or crossbows, with most lacking significant armour protection, but that was pretty normal for bowmen anyway. Now, after his victory over Tostig and Harold Hardrada in the north, Harold Godwinson left a substantial portion of his forces, including notable earls Morcar and Edwin, in the north, and hastened south with the remainder to confront the impending Norman invasion. Harold's awareness of William's landing likely emerged during this march. He paused in London for about a week before advancing to Hastings, averaging a frankly impressive 27 miles per day over approximately 200 miles. Harold's forces encamped near Kalbdeck Hill on the 13th of October, positioning themselves strategically close to William's base at Hastings, and despite attempts to surprise the Normans, William was forewarned by his scouts of the English approach. The prelude to the Battle of Hastings is muddled with conflicting reports, but it is agreed that William's forces moved towards Harold's defensive setup on Senlac Hill, which is about six miles from Hastings. And what about the size of Harold's army? Well, just like Williams, the exact numbers are a little unclear. <laughs> With rather comical estimations from the contemporary sources, some Norman sources vastly inflating the numbers between 400,000 and 1.2 million. This is a fairly obvious exaggeration. Well, English sources possibly underplaying the number to mitigate the perception of defeat contrast sharply with these figures. 
Modern estimates suggest Harold's forces numbered between five and thirteen thousand, but there's a consensus between seven to eight thousand. This contingent comprised both the feared and professional housecarls, with only about twenty individuals, including Harold's brothers, Gyrth and Leofwine, specifically identified. Now, the English army of Harold was entirely infantry-based, with higher-ranking members likely arriving on horseback, but dismounting for combat. The corps was formed by the housecarls, donned in conical helmets, male hauberks, and carrying shields, predominantly fighting with two-handed Danish battle-axes, though swords were also used. The feared provided additional support, forming a shield wall with axemen, javelin throwers, and archers backing them up, though they were more lightly armoured and not really professional soldiers. And so we arrive to the night before the battle. Duke William's forces remained armed and vigilant against potential surprise attacks as reported by William Jumieges. Now as for the battle's location, it lies about seven miles north of Hastings, nestled between Calbeck Hill and Telham Hill, a terrain that's marked by dense woods and somewhat difficult marshland. Despite being fought closer to other settlements, it's historically dubbed the Battle of Hastings. This nomenclature is first recorded in the Domesday Book of 1086. Earlier references, such as by the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, label it the Battle at the Hoary Apple Tree, which is a little bit less catchy, isn't it? Well, another source, Orderic Vitalis, referred to it as Senlac, derived from Sandlacu, meaning sandy water in Old English, possibly naming the stream that crosses the battlefield. But of course, we're going to refer to it as the Battle of Hastings. Now, the exact path taken by Harold's English army to reach the battlefield also remains unknown, with some speculation favouring either an ancient Roman road from Rochester to Hastings, or a route from London to Lewis, then local tracks to the battlefield. While contemporary accounts, like William of Jumieges, suggest that the Normans were already present at the battle site the night prior most historians believe that the Normans advanced from Hastings on the day of the battle. So, Harold Godwinson's army, when the time had come, took a strategic defensive position on a steep slope for the battle, forming a compact shield wall to maximise protection. The English forces flanked by woods and marshes on either side, possibly extended their line to a nearby stream for additional natural defence. The exact location of their deployment is debated, though, traditional accounts placing them at the side of the latter abbey, while more recent suggestions point to the actual top of the Kaldbeck Hill. Now, the Duke of Normandy's, oh, Duke William, rather, of Normandy, his tactical arrangement of his invasion force was more clearly documented. He divided his army into three main groups, based on their geographic origins. The left flank comprised Breton forces, along with units from Anjou, Poitou, and Maine, led by Alan the Red. The central group was predominantly Norman, and was personally led by William, surrounded by his relatives and close allies. 
The right flank included forces from various French regions, commanded by William Fitz Osborne and Count Eustace II of Boulogne. William's strategy employed archers in the front to initiate the battle, supported by infantry armed with spears, with cavalry held in reserve for decisive charging when the time came. The formation aimed to soften the English defences with arrows, before close combat and a cavalry charge could break through and chase down the fleeing opponents. And so the battle commenced, with Norman archers firing uphill, but their efforts were largely ineffective against the English shield wall. The archers' arrows either deflected off the shields, or simply overshot their mark, with the Normans also disadvantaged by the absence of English archers, leaving few arrows on the field to be reused. Following the ineffectual archery barrage, William's spearmen advanced, but were repelled by a hail of javelins, axes and stones, and they were ultimately unable to breach the shield wall. The subsequent cavalry charge also failed to break through the English defences, leading to a retreat, particularly blamed on the Bretons on the Norman left flank. Amidst the retreat, a rumour of Duke William's death began to spread, causing further disarray among his forces. William, however, quickly quashed the rumour by making a visible and vocal presence among his men, yelling out to them, I'm still alive, and rallying them for a counter-attack. For some reason the image of Theoden pops into my head from Return of the King. Well, this manoeuvre caught the pursuing English forces off guard, some of whom had rallied on a hillock, only to be eventually overwhelmed by the rallying Normans. The decision for the English to pursue the retreating Normans remains another subject of debate, with sources disagreeing on whether it was a spontaneous action or one that was under the specific orders of Harold. The death of Harold's brothers, Gyrth and Leofwain, plays another role in these accounts, with their timing and manner of death varying across sources. Some narratives suggest that they died early in the battle, possibly leading Harold to resolve to fight to the death. This speculation is supported by the positioning of their bodies near Harold's after the battle suggesting they were moved there posthumously, as if they had fallen earlier in the conflict. In the midst of the battle, a pause in the fighting likely occurred early in the afternoon, serving as a critical juncture for both armies to rest and strategize. Duke William, seizing this moment, possibly formulated a new strategy based on exploiting the English tendency for pursuit, observed during earlier phases of the battle. By feigning retreats with his cavalry, William aimed to lure the English into breaking their shield wall formation, and thus create some vulnerabilities that the Normans could exploit. William of Portiers mentions that this tactic of feigned flight was deliberately employed twice, a strategy not unique to Hastings, but seen in other Norman military campaigns of the era. Despite scepticism among some historians who suggest that the accounts of feigned flight may have been post-battle fabrications to justify Norman retreats, the consensus acknowledges its strategic use at Hastings giving its detailed recordings and the strategic mindset it reveals. 
Now these tactical feints, while not dismantling the English shield wall, likely diluted its strength by thinning out the elite house cars and necessitating their replacement with less experienced and less armoured members of the feared. Despite this, the English formation remained resilient. The battle then saw renewed use of archers, followed by a concerted assault by Norman cavalry and infantry. Later sources suggest a tactical shift in archery, with orders for high-angle shooting to arc arrows over the shield wall, though contemporary accounts do not elaborate on this. The exact number of assaults William launched in the afternoon remains uncertain, with varied actions recorded by both sides. Notably, the Carmen and William of Fortiers diverge in their accounts of William's personal risk in the battle, with the former claiming two horses were killed under him, while the latter asserts it was three. While the circumstances of Harold Godwinson's death at the battle are muddled by their own conflicting accounts, William of Fortiers notes that Harold's death, without detailing how it occurred, he just says that he died at the battle. And when we look at the Bayou Tapestry, we get a different narrative that depicts a figure with an arrow in his eye beside another being slain with a sword, with the caption, Here King Harold has been killed, which of course leaves a little bit of ambiguity about Harold's depiction, or at least the manner of his death. The first particularly detailed account of Harold dying from an arrow to the eye comes from Amatus of Monte Cassino in the 1080s, later echoed by William of Melmsbury and Wace, suggesting an arrow struck Harold's eye and went all the way through to the brain. In contrast, the Carmen credits Duke of William with Harold's killing. Duke of William? Duke William, rather. A claim that's doubted by historians due to a lack of corroborating evidence. William of Jumierge's version placing Harold's death at the battle's outset is pretty much dismissed by everybody. The Chronicle of Battle Abbey suggests Harold's death occurred amid the battle's chaos, with the exact killer unknown. Could have just been a normal foot soldier. But, well, most people think the arrow in the eye is the most plausible death. Following Harold's death, English resistance crumbled, with many simply fleeing the battlefield. However, a core group of them, likely the royal household soldiers, made a brave final stand surrounding Harold's body. The Normans pursued the retreating English with only a Rear guard action at Malfos or Evil Ditch in our modern tongue, offering a substantial resistance before the battle's conclusion. The location and specifics of the Malfos encounter is, once again, something that we don't quite know for certain, but is known only as a brief but fierce confrontation where Eustace of Boulogne was seriously injured before the Normans ultimately secured victory. Harold Godwinson's defeat at Hastings can be attributed to multiple factors, which complicates the narrative of a singular cause for the English loss. It's really not that simple. One significant challenge was the need to counter two near-simultaneous invasions stretching the English military resources too thin. 
Additionally, Harold's decision to dismiss his southern forces on the 8th of September, prior to William's invasion, likely weakened his defensive capabilities. Critics of Harold's strategy argue that he acted hastily by marching south without amassing a larger force, though it is debatable whether additional troops would have significantly altered the outcome. Contrary to claims of an exhausted English army, the battle's duration, lasting from morning until dusk, suggests the English were not significantly wearied by their rapid southward march. Questions also arise regarding Harold's trust in Earls Edwin and Morgar post Torstig's defeat, potentially influencing his decision not to summon their forces for the southern defence. Some modern historians do suggest that Harold's swift movement towards Hastings aimed to limit William's ability to consolidate power and wreak further havoc from his initial foothold. Within the battle itself, though, several key elements tipped the scales into the favour of William. First of all, William's extensive military experience and the Norman army's cavalry gave them a tactical edge over the English, who lacked comparable mounted units. Also, Harold's failure to capitalize on the momentary confusion caused by rumors of William's death and the English pursuit of retreating Normans, which left their flanks vulnerable, are seen as crucial missteps. Whether these errors stemmed from command inexperience or soldier indiscipline, we really don't know for sure. It could have been either one of them. Well, it was the demise of Harold that was the real turning point. The real point that led to the complete disintegration of the English. Following the Battle of Hastings, the identification of Harold Godwinson's body became a matter of both personal and political significance. Depending on the source, his body was recognized either through the marks on his body or his distinctive armor. In a symbolic gesture of victory, and perhaps a kind of claim to legitimacy, Harold's personal standard was taken by William, and later sent to the papacy, signifying papal involvement and approval of William's claim to the English throne. The aftermath of the battle left the field strewn with bodies of the dead, including some of Harold's brothers and his loyal housecarls. While the Norman casualties were collectively buried in an unmarked grave that remains undiscovered to this day. The English dead initially received no such honour, which somewhat reflects the brutal norms of medieval warfare and the victor's prerogatives. Over time, though, relatives managed to reclaim some of the bodies for proper burial, indicating the personal tragedies that unfold alongside the broad historical narratives. No one remembers the mothers, the fathers, and sons and daughters who have to go and pick up the broken, battered corpses of their relatives. Yeah, no one ever writes about that. Well, the precise number of casualties also remains a mystery. And of course, the estimates of suggested devastating loss on both sides. Possibly 2,000 Normans and twice as many Englishmen. The grim tally underscores the brutality of the battle. And intriguingly, recent archaeological finds 
challenge long-held beliefs that acidic soil conditions would prevent the recovery of human remains and artifacts, and it gives us a new possibility to understand the battle's physical context. So, looking forward to a few more digs. William's victory did not immediately secure his rule over England. Instead of surrendering, the surviving English leaders proclaimed Edgar the Aetheling as the new king, which of course led William to work a bit of overtime in undertaking a military campaign to consolidate his control. That being said, there wasn't much of an army left to fight on the English side. Well, his manoeuvres around London and the subsequent submission of key English leaders at Berkhamsted paved the way for his official coronation only a few months later, on December 25th of 1066. Merry Christmas, William. A moment that marked the beginning of Norman rule in England, but also the onset of prolonged resistance and rebellion against the Norman dominance. The establishment of Battle Abbey at the site of Harold's death, purportedly fulfilling a vow by William, serves as a lasting memorial to the conflict, and it's still there to this day. It's a beautiful building. Over the centuries, the Abbey and the battlefield have undergone their own changes. With the disillusion of the monasteries and later developments altering the landscape. Now, a site of historical interest managed by the English heritage. It attracts visitors and a lot of reenactors, keeping the memory of the battle alive in the public imagination. And I suppose I hope that I'm doing my part in it as well. But what about the battle's veterans and their fates? Well, some of the English fighters went to join the Varangian Guard. Others joined up with the Normans. And I suppose plenty more of them, those who were left, went out to the countryside and did what everyone else did. Farm. Well, thank you very much for listening. I told you it was a pivotal battle. You didn't believe me, didn't you? There's a reason why everyone still talks about the Battle of Hastings. One thing I will say is, if it wasn't for the Battle of Hastings and the victory by William, well, our language that we're speaking right now would be very, very different. You see, the English had their own language. And the English that we speak now is more of a, how can I put this, a lesser version of French? Perhaps so. The two great events that changed our English language to what it is now is, one, the Battle of Hastings with the Normans conquering England, and two, the great vowel shift that began at the end of the Black Plague where basically everyone came over from the heartlands of Europe and changed the language even more. But if you want to hear what Old English sounds like, it's quite easy to do so. Just get onto YouTube and search up what Old English sounded like. And then try and imagine that you, if history had have played out a little differently, you might sound exactly like that instead. Well, before I go, as always, I thank my three Mega Chad tier patrons, Stark Factory, JC, and Jeffrey. Thank you very much, guys. The Trinity of Chads. If you'd like to become a member of the Patreon, it's pretty easy to do so. You only need to follow the links and you'll find it. But, until next time, I hope you've enjoyed the content. As always, I'm working very hard. And there will be plenty more to come. 
See you in the next video. Good night.